Bridget was looking through the investigator's reports, looking for anything that might interest her. The situation seemed simple. A farmer named Palmer, who lived along the highway leading to Putana, Virginia, heard what sounded like gunshots in an abandoned barn on his property. He walked along the straight and thought that it might be a hunter, especially since his land was very close to the hunting grounds. Entering the barn, he discovered the motionless body of a woman. He immediately called 911. When police and emergency responders arrived on the scene, they found the woman dead from a gunshot wound to the heart. The victim's car was parked in a barn. Documents found in the woman's purse left in the car identified her as Kelly Russell, the wife of Richmond financial advisor Barry Russell. Investigators examined the crime scene and found no signs of a fight or robbery. Lady Russell's purse remained untouched. She also had $125 in cash in her purse. No murder weapon was found at the crime scene. However, 30 feet of shell casings were found on the barn floor. A medical examiner later confirmed that Russell was shot at point-blank range with a 9-gauge pistol. The time of death is believed to have been about 15 years. Bridget casually opened the coroner's report. Everything seems normal until he sees a photo of the victim taken at the crime scene. The bullet caused instant death, and Bridget expected to see fear or perhaps pain on the woman's face. Instead, the corpse's face showed a look of shock. Brigitte's heart began to beat faster. Maybe this is it, he thought. After offering formal condolences for his wife's death and a not-so-sincere apology for disturbing him while he was grieving, the two detectives sat down to talk to Barry Russell in his home office. Mr. Russell, does your wife have any enemies? Would anyone wish him harm? Asked the chief detective. No, Barry responded in surprise. Everyone loves Kelly. I've never heard anyone say anything bad about her. The detective nodded and made a note on the notepad he held in his hand. Both you and her? Are there any disagreements or questions? No, Barry repeated. So their wedding was perfect in every way. The detective stressed that there were no disputes or disagreements. No, I wouldn't say that, Barry winced. You know, in every marriage, there are contradictions, expenses, budget, priorities, and all that. The young detective leaned forward. Then they fought over money. We weren't fighting, Barry said quickly. We had some disagreements, but nothing serious. He looked at the detective's left hand. I see you have a wedding ring, detective. You mean you and your wife never had any disagreements about spending? The older detective smiled and the younger one blushed. Let's go back to the day your wife died, he said. What was he doing in the old barn on the Palmer farm? I wish I knew, detective, Barry said. As I told the police, she called me and asked me to meet her there at 14 o'clock. He said he wanted to show me a great opportunity, but he didn't have time to talk about it right now. He didn't really want to go especially since I had a meeting at my home office at 4 p.m., but I promised him I would go. But you don't have time, said the young detective. No, I didn't do that, Barry explained. On the way, I got a flat tire. Replacing the spare tire took a long time and got me very dirty. Having finished, I barely had time to get home, take a shower, and change clothes when my clients arrived at 4 a.m. I see, muttered the lead detective. Why not call Adole to help you change your tire? Barry responded, I'm just not an AA. The detective nodded. What did Mrs. Russell say when you called her and told her you couldn't come? Barry hung his head in shame. I didn't call her. I quickly left without my phone. When I got home, showered and changed, the client was already there. Is it 16 o'clock? Asked the chief detective. Yes, Barry answered. It arrived on time. Can anyone see you between 14 o'clock and 16 o'clock? Barry thought for a moment. No, as far as I know. The young detective continued the interrogation. So let's go back to when you got home. Was it around 3.30 p.m.? Barry nodded. Then you shower, put on a clean suit and tie, and go see your client. It's true, Barry confirmed. What do you do after a client leaves? Asked the detective. I'll collect the dirty clothes and take them to the dry cleaner, Barry replied. I see, said the young detective. It's really convenient. What's actually practical? Barry asked, confused. The young detective watched him carefully. He said that you can shower at home, which is very convenient, and the suit can be dry cleaned right away. It's very simple. Barry looked at him in confusion. I still don't understand. The detective looked at him carefully. This would certainly destroy any gunshots or other investigative evidence of the shooting, he said. Barry's face showed anger and disbelief. Wait a minute. I had nothing to do with my wife's murder. I'm telling you, I didn't even make it to the Palmer farm. I can't believe you thought I was a suspect. The two detectives looked at each other. 
Do you have any suspicions, Mr. Russell? Is there anything you would like to share about your wife's passing? The leader of the detective team asked mischievously. Barry was getting more and more worried. If I were a suspect, I think I would need a lawyer, and I will not answer your questions until I consult with a lawyer, he said firmly. The two agents looked at each other again and then simultaneously stood up and walked away. If you believe your actions require legal advice, that is your right. But we'll be back, Mr. Russell. I promise. Bridget pressed the speed dial button on her phone, heard an answer and said, Hi, Jill. It's your sister calling. Hello, BG. There was a voice on the other end of the line. I was hoping it was you. I haven't heard from you for several days. Sorry for not calling earlier, but I was busy with my project. Guess what? You may have found what you were looking for. As he did so, he began describing Russell's case, including what he had learned from investigators' reports and photographs taken by the medical examiner. Wait a minute, BG. How did you get the DA's and the medical examiner's reports? These are confidential documents. Bridget smiled awkwardly. Well, I could tell the police that I'm still working for a criminal gang, and I could suggest that I might be a good subject for an on-camera interview when the TV station does a story on the case. He paused and then smiled again. You know, the police always appreciate a little publicity, he joked. You still can't get over the fact that I work for the Washington, D.C. Police Department, Jill replied cheerfully. But I can tell you, no attractive young writer will receive confidential information from me. The sisters joked among themselves, but then Gil asked, what's next in your plan to become the next great American nonfiction writer? Bridget said the next step was to go to Richmond and convince my husband to join me in this project. What do you want to do? The sister asked doubtfully. That's true, Bridget replied. I just walked up to him and asked. I actually made an appointment with him tomorrow. Jill's voice immediately became serious. Look, Bridget, I want you to be careful with this guy. You know as well as I that when a woman is murdered, the prime suspect is usually a man. If this guy killed his wife, he could easily kill her again to protect his secret. Yes, lady. I promise I'll be careful, Bridget replied in a childish voice. He then immediately returned to his normal tone. Seriously, Jill, I know you're right, but I'm an adult and I know how to behave. I would never be in a vulnerable position. Everything is fine. Jill said helplessly, but take this seriously. If something happened to you, I wouldn't know how to deal with it. I swear, Jill, Bridget replied solemnly, and I promise to call you regularly to keep you updated. Don't let him get you in trouble in Washington, Jill threatened. The next morning, Barry is still angry about the police visit, but has calmed down after meeting a potential client. As business slows after the recession, the company is looking to acquire as many new businesses as possible. When the doorbell rang, Barry was already waiting in the hallway and quickly ushered Bridget Callahan inside. Following her to her home office, he wondered who she thought would be her next client. He estimated she was about 30 years old, the same age as Kelly, he thought. He has short brown hair, a charming slender figure under his suit, and leather shoes. Barry sat on the couch and chairs in his office and served them coffee. He tries to create the most comfortable conditions for his clients so that they are more willing to discuss their financial situation. He took a sip of coffee and looked at the cup that would be handed to the new customer, trying not to take his eyes off her face. So Callahan, tell me about some of your financial goals, he said. He placed the cup on the coffee table and clasped his hands. Firstly, Mr. Russell, please accept my deepest condolences on the passing of your wife. I know how shocking this must be for you. Thank you, Miss Callahan, he replied. You are a good person, she continued calmly. Secondly, I deeply apologize for misleading you. I'm not here for financial advice. Let us offer you a unique and mutually beneficial offer. Barry looked at her in surprise. Are you a seller? He asked angrily. Of course not, he answered dryly. I have been a Crime Channel reporter for five years and have extensive criminal justice experience. Now I want to write a book about my wife's death and the subsequent investigation to identify the culprit and bring him to justice. That's why I'm here to seek your full cooperation every step of the way. The teacher looked at her in surprise. Why the hell should I do this? I asked him. She looked at him without moving. Because if you don't, you will find yourself in a completely hopeless situation. Barry stood up and blushed. If it had been a threat, I assure you it would not have worked for me. Now I think it's time for you to go, Miss Callahan. The young woman ignored her anger and sat quietly. Mr. Russell, let me explain. 
Give me five minutes. If you still want me to leave, I will leave and you will never hear from me again. Wait five minutes. Barry sat down and crossed his arms over his chest. Okay, but only five minutes, he warned. Bridget opened the large bag she was carrying, took out a tablet and began flipping through it. Mr. Russell, the police have been to you before and I'm sure it was a very disturbing experience. How do you know? He asked in surprise. Two reasons, he said, counting on his fingers. Firstly, as I said, I have a lot of experience in police investigations and I know how they work. In the absence of a clear choice, they always doubt their spouse. But it's not fair, Barry exclaimed. Are you telling me that just because Kelly and I are in a relationship that I've already been charged? Bridget ignored his objections. Another reason I know of has to do with today's news in the Richmond Times Dispatch. What's new? asked Barry. I haven't seen today's newspaper. She handed him the tablet. The Times local news section opens in the browser with the title Police Case. The husband was involved in Russell's murder. The article said investigators conducted a second round of interviews with Barry and described him as a person of interest. No charges have been brought yet, the journalist added. The rest of the article is devoted to describing the crime itself. This is terrible, Barry exclaimed when he read it. It looks like his arrest is only a matter of time. As soon as Bridget nodded, Barry sat down in the chair. I thought that in America you're innocent until proven guilty. It's true in court, Bridget said, but you were judged by the court of public opinion. From now on, we must compete on equal terms. Before he could continue, the phone on Barry's desk rang. He walked up to the machine and said, I need to answer this call. This is my normal conversation. When she nodded, he picked up the phone and said, Hi, Tom. How can I help you? He listened for some time with a hint of displeasure on his face. Tom, you've been a client of mine for a long time. Are you unhappy with your portfolio results? There was another long pause as his irritation grew. But you can't believe it, he said finally. Despite what his wife's friends say, I had nothing to do with what happened to Kelly. God, I love him. After another long pause, his shoulders slumped and his voice became quieter. It's okay, Tom. I understand. Maybe when everything is done, we can do business together again. He slowly hung up the phone and returned to his chair. I can't believe it, he whispered. A regular customer of mine called me and asked me to close the business because his wife and friends thought I was responsible for Kelly's death. Bridget walked over and patted Barry on the arm sympathetically. Sorry, Barry, but that's exactly what I said. Now that police haven't made any arrests, people are starting to speculate about what exactly happened. And it's no wonder they started with you. Barry covered his face with his hands. If they hadn't called me, I would never have believed it. I just don't understand how someone who has known me for so long can believe that I am capable of killing someone. It's terrible, Barry, but the lack of evidence only adds fuel to the fire. People thought that something had happened that they didn't even know existed. She shook her head, and that wasn't the worst of it. Even if you are completely acquitted, there will still be people who don't know it, or worse, don't believe it. Interesting rumors are much more powerful and exciting than simple facts. Even after the process is completed, doubts and accusations often remain. I promise good news about you won't get as much attention as bad news. I can't believe this is happening. What I should do? Change your name and move to another country? Barry asked impatiently. I think there's another option and that's why I'm here, Bridget said. I said that I am a writer. Let me write your story. Open up to me. Share your thoughts and feelings as well as the facts of the case. Let people see the truth. But how are the stories you write for Crime Channel different? I ask him. Bridget points out that this is completely different. First of all, these series are about crimes committed many years ago. Second, they only tell the stories of the guilty, not those who were falsely accused. I want to write about some cases that are developing. I wanted to know the truth before it was established. She stopped and took a deep breath. Have you read In Cold Blood by Truman Capote? When he shook his head, she continued, This is probably the most famous non-fiction crime book. One of its unique features is the wide access that Capote gave both killers. He could understand their relationship and describe their thoughts and feelings. Well, I want to go further than Capote. I wanted to follow the crime almost from the moment it happened. I wanted to know the truth before it was established. That sounds very interesting, Miss Callahan. But what does this mean for me? Asked Barry. It means everything, Barry, he said confidently. No one has done this before, and it is sure to attract a lot of media attention. My book will help people understand not only their logic, but also what happened throughout the process. I believe that people will literally fall at your feet 
apologize for doubting you, and welcome you into the community with open arms. When she finished her description, Barry looked at her, then a mysterious expression appeared on his face. According to him, there's only one problem in all this. When she looked at him doubtfully, he said, what if I'm guilty? Bridget looked at him in surprise and gulped, but then regained her composure and said, then I'll come and see you in prison. He looked at her for a long second, then looked at the Times article. Finally, he nodded and extended his hand. Well, Bridget, we have a deal. Hi, sister. Guess what? I met this guy, and he agreed to let me write his story. He agreed to open up and let me know what he was thinking and feeling. This could be my big opportunity. Good job, BG. I'm not a literary critic, but I think you found something new. What was your first impression when meeting him in person? Well, he seemed smart and successful, at least until recently. The recession has affected his business and suspicions surrounding his wife's death are beginning to take their toll. I didn't ask for this. BG, do you think he is guilty or innocent? Sister, can't you stop being a cop? But to answer your question, I'm not sure. At first, I was inclined to believe that he was innocent. In my opinion, he is not the kind of man who would kill his wife. I heard him talking about her to one of his clients and he seemed genuinely saddened by her passing. But when I told him about my book, and how it helped people understand that he was innocent. One thing made me think, question, what if I'm guilty? Why would an innocent person say such a thing? Anyway, I'm going to spend the day with him tomorrow and hopefully I'll have a clearer idea later. Jill was silent for a moment. Finally, she spoke. Bridget, watch out for this guy. If he were truly innocent, I don't understand why he would be asked incriminating questions. He may have a weird sense of humor, but it bothers me. Yes. I understand what you mean, sister. Anyway, I'll let you know tomorrow what I found. Don't worry, I'll be careful. I hope I'm not interfering with your customer service, Bridget said the next morning, sitting on the couch in Barry's office. Don't worry, Barry replied bitterly. After publishing this magazine article, only two clients called me and asked me to end our relationship. I can't believe how quickly people can judge someone. He is laughing. If you weren't here, I wouldn't have anyone to talk to. She looked at him with pity and then read her notes. Then let's get started, he said. Why don't you start by telling us a little about yourself? He sat comfortably in a chair and took a sip of coffee. There's really not much to say. I was born in Richmond and have lived here all my life except when I went to college in Charlottesville. I studied finance and wanted to do an MBA after graduation, but I got a really good offer from a large financial group and decided to give it a try. I quickly discovered that I had a real knack for financial planning and decided I didn't need a degree. After a few years, when things were going well, I thought I could do it myself. So I left the company and opened my own practice. Things were going well until the recession hit the economy. Bridget recorded their conversation and took notes. Now he was looking at Barry. What made you want to go somewhere alone, she asked. Have you always wanted to be your own boss? Barry agreed that this was part of my motivation, but there was another factor around the same time I divorced my first wife. When Bridget raised her eyebrows in confusion, he continued, she and I were friends in high school. We both went to Yuba because we wanted to be together and we got married after high school. But the truth is that we have become completely different. This person and I have completely different views on life. Our differences become especially obvious during the learning process. She was very artistic and eventually became an actress. She becomes more and more idealistic and ready for any action. I am more pragmatic and focused on numbers and results. I think the point is that the only reason we got married was because we had been together for so long that it seemed like an inevitable next step. Years passed and we realized that we were not going to get married at all. The divorce occurs as peacefully as possible. How does the financial process work? Brigida asked. Do I have to pay child support? No, Barry answered cheerfully. I am very happy. She thought child support was a form sent in the mail. All I had to do was pay for his MFA. Of course, almost all my savings went to finance her studies, but that was where my obligations to her ended. He smiled. We're still talking. He even sent me birthday and Christmas cards. Bridget added a few more notes. So now you are in your 20s, divorced, working and have virtually no money. He smiles again. That's all. I assessed my abilities and decided that if I wanted to start my own business, now was the time to take the plunge. I have no dependencies or obligations. So I left it, opened my own agency, and started acting. I was lucky that everything started out very well when I met Kelly. Brigida sat down. How did this happen? 
He blushes. To be honest, I met her through one of the online dating services. Seeing her looking at him doubtfully, he quickly continued. You wouldn't believe how difficult it is to meet the right beautiful woman after college. I work 70 to 80 hours a week. I don't have time to go to bars or clubs. So I decided to try an online service, and that's how I found them and myself. But now that I think about it, she was the one who found me first. In any case, everything went well from the first meeting. We seem to have a lot in common, our values, our opinions, and our interests. She seems to like the same things I do. Even our stories are similar. She had just gotten out of a bad marriage in Atlanta and was planning to move to Richmond for a fresh start. Like me, he prefers small towns where it is not as easy to get lost as in big cities. How long were you together before you got married? Brigida asked. This time, Barry blushed. We got married just six months after we met. I know in today's world it seems too fast, but we all know what we want and what we like. We just don't see the point in waiting. Barry spread her arms as if pleading with Bridget. I know that you have seen her photos and know how beautiful she is, but it wasn't just the appearance that attracted me. It's his style, his values, his point of view. And what attracts me most is his intelligence and his pragmatism. He leaned against Bridget. Let me give you an example. It turns out she was in a good financial position after the divorce and wanted to protect these funds in case things didn't work out for us. I felt the same way about my business, so we created a prenuptial agreement to protect those assets in the event of a divorce. Many women would have felt threatened by such a proposal, but she immediately understood that I was trying to protect both of us. He leaned back in his chair. I'll never find someone like her. That night, Bridget thoughtfully called her sister. I knew I had to keep my distance, he said, but I felt sorry for the guy. I just don't think he's the kind of man who would kill his wife. Jill's voice sounded like she was talking. Bridget, do you know what a sociopath is, she asked. Of course I do, Bridget says, and Barry is not a sociopath. I believe he is an intelligent and caring man who has suffered a great loss and is now being unfairly blamed. In my opinion, he's certainly not crazy, but that doesn't mean he's not a sociopath, Jill responded. Look for some common traits of sociopaths, and I quote, superficial charm and good intelligence. There were no signs of irrational thinking, unreliability, lies and dishonesty, lack of remorse and shame, antisocial behavior, etc. Where did you get all this information from? Brigida asked. This is discussed in Hervey Cleckley's book, The Mask of Sanity. It is considered one of the leading clinical descriptions of psychopathy and antisocial behavior, Gill says firmly. Well, I still don't believe it. Bridget said firmly, First of all, many of these traits characterize many completely normal people. Secondly, the absence of any signs of irrational behavior does not prove that you are insane. Third, it is unknown whether other personality traits such as lying and antisocial behavior can be masked. Hello. Hello, BG. I'm not making any accusations here. I just want you to be careful with this guy. If he really was a sociopath, and I'm not saying he is, I'm just saying it's possible, then he could be very charming and controlling. What I'm trying to say is keep your eyes open and be careful. Everything is fine? It's okay, sister. It's okay, Bridget sighed. I'll be careful. You always took good care of me. I won't do anything stupid. The next day, Bridget was leaving Barry's house when her cell phone rang. Looking at the screen, he was surprised to see another call from Jill. I'm so glad I called you, Jill breathed. In all the talk about sociopaths yesterday, I completely forgot something else you said. Didn't you mention that Barry and Kelly are married? Yes, yes, Bridget replied. But why is this so important? You don't understand, Jill said enthusiastically. This is the reason for the murder. Barry's company was losing money and needed cash flow. She received money from her ex-husband. But after the divorce, Barry was unable to access it because they had a prenuptial agreement. But if she dies, all property goes to the surviving spouse. Follow the money, Bridget. This is the oldest theme in the book. Bridget didn't answer, so Jill continued impatiently. So BG, what do you think? I never thought about the consequences of their marriage contract, Bridget said quietly. I really want to explore this. Then he hastily added, Listen, sister, I'm late. I'll call you later and tell you what I found. Be careful, Jill said before Bridget hung up. On the way to Barry's house, Bridget felt dizzy. Could he really be a killer? She wants to know. Is it really a matter of greed? As she drives, she reminds herself that the killers in Capote's book are just thieves, but that doesn't diminish the book's impact. But the thought that Barry could be the killer made her strangely sad. 
This doesn't look very good, he thought sadly. When Bridget finally arrived, Barry was working on a spreadsheet. He noticed how she looked when she walked into his office and immediately knew something was wrong. What happened, Brigida? What's happened? A curious expression appeared on his face, and instead of sitting on the sofa, he stopped. Finally, as if preparing to do something unpleasant, he took a deep breath and spoke. I don't know if you noticed, but yesterday you told me something that could have been the motive for the murder. She ran forward, and Barry looked at her questioningly. You told me that you and Kelly had a prenuptial agreement to divide your assets before you got married. Therefore, the only way to use your money to save your business is to inherit it when you die. Barry looked at her for a long moment, and Bridget found herself holding her breath as she studied her. Then he laughed. Does this bother you? Getting extra money is not a problem. Kelly wanted to give my company a loan from her funds to help it stay afloat. We even conclude an agreement with all the conditions. I don't know where the contract is now, but maybe I can find it if it makes you feel better. He paused, then continued more carefully. We wanted to sign the contract the night she was killed, but we didn't have that opportunity. He sat heavily on the couch in his office, obviously still remembering the last conversation between him and his wife. Bridget sat down next to him, clearly relieved to have such a simple explanation of the situation. I'm so sorry, Barry. I should have known that everything is not as it seems. I was really trying to explore all the possibilities and it was all very confusing. He looked at her knowingly. No, do not apologize. He tries to do his job well, which means he takes advantage of all possible opportunities. I'm honored that you don't want to judge me. She smiled shyly at him. He smiled back and stood up abruptly. Look, it's driving me crazy having to deal with all of this. Let's not waste any more time on this today. I don't have time this afternoon. It's spring and I'm tired of being stuck at home. Let's go outside and enjoy the nice weather and forget about all the police work. It sounded good and Bridget immediately agreed and allowed Barry to walk her to the car. Where are we going? She asked, but he just smiled and asked her to be patient. In a tense moment, Kelly thought he was going to take them to the farm west of Richmond where Kelly died, but instead headed north of the city. Finally, he turned onto Lakeshore Drive and continued until he reached the Louis Ginther Arboretum. She looked at him curiously. I have to admit, it wasn't what I expected, Kelly told him. You are an unusual person. Every time I think I understand you, you surprise me. Once through the gate, Barry led Bridget to the right, exploring the various gardens along the winding circular path. They spent the whole day wandering around the many gardens and exhibitions. When they finally reached Asiatic Valley, Barry took Bridget to a bench by a pond in the shade of a Japanese maple tree, where they sat and enjoyed the tranquility that surrounded them. I like to come here when I need to think, he says with a smile. By the time they got back to the car, the shadows had lengthened, and when Barry knew the time, she apologized to Bridget for taking him so long. He quickly put his worries aside. It's a good day, Barry. I felt like I never had the chance to leave. For the first time, I could forget about everything else and just have fun. He hesitated for a moment and then asked if she had any plans for the night. When she said no, he continued, I don't know about you, but after running for so long, I'm hungry. Would you like to have dinner with me? Then, before she could answer, he added, but with one condition, we won't talk about the crime, Kelly, or anything like that. Bridget smiled and agreed. They left the Arboretum, and Barry led them across the James River to Bookbinders, a former restaurant converted into a tobacco warehouse. It was warm at night, and it was nice to sit at a table on the terrace. Barry ordered a bottle of wine, and the dinner conversation went well. First, they told us what they thought about the botanical garden. Barry then told Bridget about other places and things to do in Richmond that she might enjoy. Later, the conversation moved on to other topics, and Barry told him interesting stories from his student days and his adventures in starting his own business. By the time they finished and returned to the car, the temperature had dropped enough for Barry to put his jacket back on. He placed it on her shoulder, and she nodded gratefully. When they returned to the car, Barry drove them across the river on 14th Street and continued until they reached Highway 301. He then turned north and took her across the Robert E. Lee Bridge so she could enjoy the view of the Mountains of Light. When they finally returned to Barry's office, he invited her to have a cup of coffee. The night air was still cool, and she gratefully accepted. As they sat down to drink, Barry had a confused look on his face. Noticing the look on his face, Bridget asked what happened. 
You have to believe that I am the biggest egoist in the world. I just realized I've been talking about myself all night, he apologized. No, no, I don't care, she smiled. I'm interested to know more about you. Besides, isn't it my job to question the theme of my book? He smiled. Well, now it's my turn to ask you, Miss Callahan. I want to hear your story. She tried to shake off his interest. I can't say anything about myself. I'm one of those people who is so focused on work that I don't have time for anything else. Do you have brothers or sisters, I ask him. Only one sister, Jill, lives in Washington. She's a police officer. In fact, Barry answered, isn't this interesting? All have pursued careers in various areas of criminal justice. I know she's a cop and you're a mystery writer, but your goals remain the same. That's a coincidence. Bridget's smile disappeared. Jill is my sister, so it's no surprise that she influenced me. Barry continues to persevere. But of course, there is still a lot to be done. What made you decide to join crime? Is your father a police officer? Bridget remained motionless as if holding her breath, and her face turned pale. Then, to Barry's surprise, she closed her eyes and large tears rolled down her cheeks. She covered her face with her hands and sobbed like a sad girl. Barry was shocked and didn't know what to do. He sat unsteadily, sinking into his chair, and after a moment, Bridget began to speak, her voice broken by sobs. I was in seventh grade when this happened. My friend's mother dropped me off at school, and when I got home, the side door we always used was open. It wasn't normal, but I didn't think much about it. So I went in, I shouted to my mother that I was back, but she stopped answering. When there were still no answers, I began to worry. I entered the living room and found the floor lamp knocked over and the furniture in disarray. Then I saw blood on the floor, and I remember how my whole body began to shake. I don't know why, but I returned to my parents' room. When I looked out the door, I saw his legs sticking out on the other side of the bed. Barry turned pale as she listened, but Bridget didn't notice because her eyes were still closed. He apparently remembers every detail of this terrible scene. Looking at her, I saw that her clothes were torn. I especially remember her panties hanging down to her ankles. This was the first time I saw my mother naked. After having sex with her, he shot her in the stomach. I kept calling her name, pulling her hand and trying to lift her up. Jill always comes home later than me and she must have heard me because she ran into the room. She also started crying, but she was older and stronger than me and dragged me from the bedroom to the living room. He then called 911 and held me until the police arrived. Barry walked over to her and hugged her as she cried. My God, Brigida, I'm so sorry. I can't imagine how scary this must be for you. Bridget looked at him with red, frightened eyes. That's not all. When dad returned home, he was hysterical. They covered mom with a sheet, but when she saw what the monster was doing to her, she tore it off and screamed. The police had to torture him. Dad loves us, he always cares for us and always tries to protect us. She started crying again, but his mother was the light of his life and finding her in such a state was unbearable. Later, when Jill and I went to a neighbor's house to spend the night, he put a gun to her head and shot her. Oh my God, Barry gasped. Now Bridget's eyes were begging him to understand. I've heard people say that my father was selfish when they thought I couldn't listen to them. They said he felt responsible for Jill and me and put his pain first. But I know that's not true. I know that the man who killed my mother also killed my father, as if he was the one who pulled the trigger. She cried again and Barry hugged her, shocked by her terrible story. After a few minutes, she raised her eyes and looked at him. We had no other family to live with. Our grandparents died and mom and dad had no brothers or sisters. The authorities wanted to place us in foster care, but Jill, who was 18 at the time, refused. She eventually became my guardian and raised me. It was hard, but we made it through with the help of life insurance and social security money for my dad. Despite this, Gil immediately decided to become a police officer. I wasn't as brave as her, so I didn't follow her, but I'm still focused on the culprit. Either way, we want to prevent this from happening to others. Having said this, he buried his head in Barry's shoulder and cried even more. Barry hugged her and gently stroked her back, like a father comforting a grieving child. I'm so sorry, Brigida. I don't know what to say, he said quietly. A few minutes later, he whispered, I think we've all lost people we love to violence. Surprised, she pulled back and looked at him, thinking she saw her pain on his face. In his grief, he completely forgot that he had just lost his wife. She pulled him closer and they hugged like lost souls. After a moment, everyone calmed down, then Bridget pulled back enough to look Barry in the eye. 
She then leaned forward and kissed him tenderly on the lips. He responded to the kiss with warmth and gratitude. She looked at him again, and this time he saw determination in her eyes. He leaned in again, but this time his kiss was full of promise. The strong emotion she was feeling now turned into passion, and she parted her lips and allowed his tongue to explore her mouth. Almost immediately there was warmth between them, and they kissed passionately, like lovers reunited after a long separation. Finally, Barry moved away from her and kept his distance. Are you sure, Brigida? I asked him. She answered without hesitation. I am more sure of this than of anything else in my life. With these words, he took her in his arms again and almost desperately began to kiss her lips, eyes, and neck. He suddenly picked her up, carried her back to the bedroom, laid her on her back, and lay down next to her. In between kisses, they began to play with each other's clothes, desperately trying to remove the barriers between them. But as she pulled down her knitted blouse, Barry thought she noticed a slight hesitation in her movements. She felt the tension in her muscles as she ran her hands over her smooth stomach. What happened, Brigida? He asked worriedly. Questions? Should I stop? He moved his hand away from her, but she grabbed it and placed it back on her bra-clad breasts. No, don't stop, he said. I've never done this before. Then she awkwardly looked away, and he looked at her in surprise. The next second, he leaned down and kissed her tenderly. Everything is fine, he assured. I know what I need to do. He stood up, took off her underwear, and helped her undress. He almost smiled as he took off her skirt. She was wearing polka dot baby panties. With these words, he ordered her to turn over in bed. He then began to give her a long, gentle massage on her back and neck. After a few minutes, he felt her muscles relax and she began to purr in pleasure at what he was doing. When he felt she was relaxed enough, he moved down and began to massage the two edges of her buttocks. He tried to touch her without being intimate, but she clearly enjoyed the pressure and perversion, and soon he smelled the unmistakable scent of an aroused woman. Then they had sex. After a minute or two, she rolled onto her back next to him, still breathing heavily. Barry got out of bed and went to the bathroom. A minute later, he returned with a wet rag and a towel, which he handed to Bridget. When she finished speaking, he climbed back onto the bed next to her and lifted the blanket to cover them both. A few minutes later, they both fell asleep. When the morning sun woke him, Barry turned to look at his alarm clock and was surprised to find that he had slept an hour longer than usual. He then remembered what happened last night and quickly turned around to see if Bridget was nearby, but she wasn't. He looked around, then stood up and looked towards the bathroom, but there was nothing there either. But when he returned to bed, he noticed a note on the pillow she had used. Hello, Sonia. I had an appointment this morning, so I went alone. Bridget, P.S., I'll call you. Bang, 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 you're snoring. Bang, bang, last night was great. Hello, Jill. Sorry, I didn't call yesterday. Where have you been? I was a little worried when you didn't call. Sorry, sister, but something incredible happened. BG, what did you do? Yes, my God, you slept with him. I hear it in your voice. Stupidity. I could never deceive you. It's like you can read my mind sometimes. You're crazy. I can't believe you let me seduce you. It can kill you like the beast killed your mother. No, Jill. No, this is not true. He didn't seduce me. Besides, I seduced him. We're talking about mom. Did you tell him about her? Why do this? BG, we were talking about our past and suddenly everything became clear. I cried and he hugged me and tried to console me. When I calmed down, I realized that his wife was killed in the same way as his mother. Then I tried to console him, but for some reason the situation became heated and tense, and now I was no longer a virgin. Therefore, he takes advantage of your fragile emotional state and your weakness. No, it's not like that at all. He is gentle, loving, and caring. I feel completely safe. I don't even think he's capable of violence. Listen to me, Bridget Callahan. No matter how much they love each other, the fact remains that someone killed his wife and he is the only suspect with a possible motive. Plus, he has every reason to be nice to you because you're writing a book that will prove his innocence. Of course, he wants you to love him. I understand what you're saying, but you don't know it as well as I do. So before I start another conference, I promise to be careful and communicate better. I promise, sister, sister. Well, BG, but remember, if something happened to you, I don't know what I would do. Hello, I feel the same way about you. The alarm sounded at 10 o'clock. M and Barry responded quickly, expecting it to be a new client, but this was not the case. Instead, the humiliated caller asked, Is that Barry Russell? Yes, my name is Barry Russell. Barry Russell, who is Kelly Russell's wife? Yes. What are we talking about? You think your wife is a saint, but in reality, she is an ordinary, quiet girl. What the heck? 
I don't know who you are, but you have no right to insult my late wife. Telling the truth is not an insult, Russell. You won't believe me? Well, you should, because she slept with Bill McAvoy right under your nose. Bill McAvoy. Kelly didn't know him at all and would never do such a thing. If you don't believe me, why don't you ask one of her friends? I'm sure they know everything. God, I'm pretty sure half of it is helping him hide it from you. Look, it doesn't matter who you are. While you're sitting there crying, everyone behind you is probably laughing. Who are you? Barry shouted, but the line went dead. A few minutes later, Barry went to Jared and Susan Jackson's house. Barry and Kelly often hang out with the Jackson family, and Susan is probably Kelly's best friend. When Barry rang the doorbell, Susan answered, Oh, Barry, you're scaring me. I didn't expect you. If you're looking for Jared, he's at work, she said hesitantly. Actually, I want to talk to you. Susan, do you mind if I come for a few minutes? He asked coldly. Nature. Of course, he said hastily. I'm listening. I'm sorry I didn't visit you after the funeral. There is a lot going on here and we have a lot to do. He raised his hand to interrupt their conversation. Knowing Susan and knowing how close she was to Kelly, Barry decided that if he asked her a simple yes or no question, she would do whatever it took to protect her boyfriend. He then decides to adopt a more radical strategy. He crossed his arms over his chest and looked at the woman seriously. How long have you known Kelly and Bill McAvoy? Asked. He looked carefully at her face and saw how surprised she was. She was silent for a long time, apparently searching for the right words. This confirmed his suspicions. The anonymous caller told the truth. All the adrenaline that had been pumping through him since the conversation seemed to disappear, and he sank into the chair behind him, covering his face with his hands. What happened to Kelly and Bill? She asks every week, please don't lie to me, Susan. Now it's too late, he said. Susan sat down opposite him and looked at him, moving her hands nervously. Barry, I don't know what to say, she said in a pleading voice. Just answer my question. How long will it take? His eyes scanned the room as if looking for a way out, but he couldn't find one. He spread his hands helplessly. I don't know. Maybe six months or so. Six months, Barry shouted, and she flinched at his anger. How can you remain silent? I tried to warn you, Barry, Susan replied. I told him that he was playing with fire, but he didn't listen to me. Suddenly, Barry remembered something else the anonymous caller had said and asked, who else knows? I thought that after a while you knew almost everything, Susan answered reluctantly. Kelly didn't even try to hide it. Some of us even think that you know this and like these strange things. God, you know me better, Barry exploded angrily. I will never be able to accept this. Susan sat in a chair pale as far away from Barry as possible. After a while, he calmed down with a sad expression on his face. Why didn't you tell me, Susan? It's been six months. Why didn't you tell me? She held out her hands pleadingly. I can't, Barry. She is my friend. I just can't do it. He stood up and looked at her coldly. I also thought that you were my friend. Thank God, nothing. He then left the house and walked away, leaving a shocked Susan to pick up her phone and call her friends. One night, Bridget came to Barry's house and rang the doorbell. When he opened the door, she jumped in surprise. He stood holding a bag of frozen peas before his eyes. God, Barry, what happened? I was arguing, he said, letting her into his office. Do you have an argument? Bridget asked incredulously. This is not your style. Barry begins to tell the whole story, starting with the anonymous phone call and meeting with Susan Jackson. After she confirmed everything, I went straight to McAvoy's office. When his wife died of cancer, the villain inherited the fortune and now spends most of his time tinkering with his stock portfolio. When I came in, he was with someone who worked for him, but I interrupted him. When I told him who I was, he was scared at first. Then I laughed and hit him. Barry tried to smile, but the movement stung his eyes and he groaned involuntarily. Who would have thought that a martial artist would become his assistant? They eventually took me out of the office and McAvoy threatened to call the police if I returned. Bridget was clearly shocked by her story. Barry, you committed an attack. If he wants to stalk you, he can arrest you. Considering why I attacked him in the first place, I doubt he'd want to do it. Besides, it was me who got hit, not him. Bridget looked at him disapprovingly. For someone who just started arguing, you don't seem very remorseful. His expression noticeably darkens. I don't even know what to feel. I was grieving the death of my wife and now I found out that she cheated on me behind my back. How should I feel? I'm angry, hurt, confused, and I'll never regret attacking the bastard who betrayed me. Bridget flinched at his outburst. 
but felt a pang of sympathy as she tried to imagine how conflicted he must have felt. Barry, I'm so sorry for what happened, and I can only imagine what you're going through right now. She reached out and took his hand. You want me to stay tonight and talk to you about everything? He shook his head and his face contorted in pain again. The truth is that I just need time to think about things. It's hard to find out that everything you believed in turned out to be a lie. He took her hand, and Bridget felt the sparkle in his eyes. I can't believe she cheated on me. I also couldn't believe that all my so-called friends knew what she was doing and never told me. The fact that many of them knew about it only made the situation worse. Kelly didn't seem to care if he knew about it. It's like she doesn't respect me at all. This makes me very angry. Having said this, she unconsciously shook his hand and suddenly Bridget screamed, Barry, you hurt me. He immediately lets her go and apologizes. I'm so sorry, Brigida. I don't know what I'm doing. You will understand why it is better for me to be alone today. She nodded and raised her hand to touch his face. I'll call you tomorrow and check on you, he promised, turning to leave. She frowned worriedly as she walked away. I've never seen him like this before, he thought. Hello, sister, it's me. How are you, BG? Yesterday your voice sounded like you were ready to sing. Today it feels like the weight of the world is pressing down on you. How are you, Jill? Barry confuses me. Let me tell you what happened today. Bridget then told her sister about the events of that day, including her attack on Bill McAvoy and the anger she saw in him. He doesn't look like himself, sister. There was anger in him that I had never seen before. This scares me a little. Wow. This is a very interesting story and raises some interesting questions. What if Kelly's murder was motivated not by money, but by jealousy? I don't even need to tell you how many husbands have killed their wives for this reason, but it can't be true, sister. Only today, she learned about his trap. We don't know, BG. All we know is that today she found out who he cheated on her with. What if he had discovered his infidelity earlier? What if he lured her to the farm and shot her for treason? I have no idea. My sister, when I spoke to him this afternoon, was not acting like that. It's right. BG, he's faking it. This is what I want to tell you. People like him are very convincing. I understand what you're saying, but I still don't think you're right. When you think about this, I want to think about you a little more. I did some research here and this is what I found. It turns out Kelly wasn't just lying about her devotion. What are you talking about, Jill? It turns out that Kelly Russell's story is a little more complicated than Barry might have imagined. I actually think it's harder than you think. I searched and found this. He comes from a poor family living in Flora. Alabama is a small town located on the Alabama-Florida border. She attended Flower High School where she was a Wildcats cheerleader. She also dated Johnny Rayburn. After high school, they both attended Jefferson Davis Community College in Bruton, Alabama. Finally, they got married. This is true, Brigida asked. I'm sure Barry didn't know. Wait, that's not all. It turns out she left Rayburn for Atlanta a year or two after the wedding. She must have been beautiful back then because she met her next husband while working as a bartender at Coyote Ugly Restaurant. This is a developer taking advantage of Atlanta's construction boom. They eventually got married soon after, but a few years after their wedding, he died suddenly of a heart attack. He then moved to Richmond, where, of course, he met Barry. Wow, she's a busy girl. And one more thing, BG. Atlanta police told me the contractor's family never liked Kelly and didn't think he had a heart problem. They asked the police and courts to investigate his death. This is great information, sister and will help my progress with the novel. But I don't know how relevant this is to today's situation. Do you think the killer could have been a member of the businessman's family? I have no idea. BG, I'm just trying to help you gather enough evidence to put it together. One thing is for sure, don't let your guard down when it comes to Barry Russell. He now has two possible reasons for killing his wife, two more than anyone else we know. No matter how charming or good he is in bed, say yes. Well, you won't have to worry about anything for the next few days. I plan to interview several other people who knew Barry and Kelly over the next few days, so I won't even be meeting this person anytime soon. Although the next two days were busy, Bridget couldn't stop thinking about Barry. Worried about a confrontation with Kelly's lover, she heeds her sister's warning. But after spending the night together, he could not contain his excitement. Part of her really wanted to reconnect and try to figure out what was going on, so she was disappointed when he didn't even call her. On the third day, he looked at his phone excitedly and discovered that he had missed her call. But as she listened to his long message, her excitement turned to worry. Bridget, I just got a call from the same person who said Kelly cheated on me. I thought it was a man, but the voice was just as deep as last time. 
Today he said he has information about Kelly's killer. He wants to meet me at Palmer's barn tonight at 5 p.m. I had to come alone, otherwise I would never have known what was really going on. I know it's risky, but I'm doing it. If I find out the truth, you can finish your book. If I don't come back, at least tell the police where they can find me. The message ends. Bridget finds herself in a difficult situation. Like Barry, she's determined to find out more about who killed Kelly Russell. And it's clear that the caller knows a lot about Barry's late wife, perhaps enough to solve the mystery. At the same time, she was very worried about Barry. Walking alone to the place where her wife was killed seemed extremely dangerous to Bridget. He desperately needed his sister's advice, but when he tried to call Jill, he was told that Jill was away on business. When he tried to call Jill's cell phone, it went straight to voicemail. After listening to her sister's recorded message, Bridget made her decision and left a long message explaining what happened and what she was going to do. After finishing, he immediately tried to call Barry, but found that his phone was not working. She cursed and threw the dead device into her bag. If I get to the yard early, I can find a spot to see who's picking up Barry, he thought. You should put off charging your phone. A few minutes later, Jill returned to the police station. Hey, the policeman called. Your sister called you while you were away. Jill quickly turned on her phone and the notification light came on after connecting to the internet. Jill felt a chill run down her spine when she heard the news about Bridget. In desperation, she quickly dialed her sister's number and received a voicemail. Bridget, it's me. Don't go to that barn. Can you hear me? It is a trap. No mysterious phone calls. Barry came up with this to lure you there. He will kill you like he killed his wife. Call me as soon as you receive this message. Whatever happens, don't go there. As soon as he said that, he called the Richmond Police Department and interviewed the detective on Russell's case. Upon learning of her absence, he questioned the police officer on duty and tried to express his concern. The policeman apparently did not understand the seriousness of the situation, but agreed to send a patrol to the farm. Jill finally hung up, upset that the officer had failed to properly assess what was happening. My God, what should I do now, she whispered. There was little traffic after exiting Highway 288 onto the Anderson Highway, and Bridget was confident that she would make it to the Palmer Farm in time to find cover and witness Barry's encounter with the mystery caller. But his confidence was shaken when a loud noise and slight spinning told him he had a flat tire. This is unbelievable, she said angrily as she parked her rental car on the side of the road. The same thing happened to Barry when Kelly was killed. He got out of the car, turned around and looked helplessly at the right front tire. I've never changed a flat tire before. Barry carefully opened the barn door with the muzzle of his father's old Winchester 3030 rifle. Barry hadn't fired the gun since his father had used it hunting years ago, but he didn't feel like going into the barn without weapons. The darkness inside was broken only by a few rays of light coming from the damaged metal roof. The old building was vacant, Barry said. Well, he thought, I came first. He saw some old haystacks to the side and sat down behind them. From here, if someone comes in, they will have a clear view of the door. Leaving the flat tire on the side of the road, Bridget threw the jack into the trunk without bothering to secure it. He got behind the wheel and quickly returned to the road, hoping to properly install the spare tire. If only I could get to the barn in time, he prayed quietly. Barry's eyes turned to darkness. In the silence, I could hear the old barn creaking and groaning every time a gust of wind blew through it. Then he heard quiet footsteps behind him. But before he could turn around, the back of his head was plunged into darkness. The pain in his head woke him up. But when he lifted his head from the ground, his stomach hurt and he fell on his side. Must be a concussion, he thought distantly. Then his head started to hurt again. And when he tried to touch her, he found that his arms and legs were tied. His fingers felt the texture of the dusty leather. And he guessed that it was attached to an old tie that hung on the wall of the barn. Part of his brain wondered how he could think so rationally, considering how much his head hurt. Then his ears heard another sound, and he carefully raised his head and looked at the barn door. As he watched, the door slowly opened, and a dark figure entered. Okay, said a male voice. It seems that you were an obedient child and did not take anyone with you. Barry tried to sit up and finally succeeded, but only at the cost of more pain in the back of his head. He choked, but once the fit was over, he was able to focus on the speaker again. It was a man, but Barry was sure he had never seen him before. Who are you? He groaned in pain. Oh, it's true, they didn't introduce us, the character said in a mocking tone. You do not know me. 
I'm Kelly's husband. Barry looked at the man in confusion. But I'm her husband, she said sadly. No, the man said angrily. You are simply their latest victim. Barry wondered if the blow to the head hurt more than she thought. You mean you're the man she married in Atlanta? I'm trying again. No, 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 the man said angrily. I'm Johnny Rayburn, your real man. Seeing Barry's confused expression, the man began to pace in front of him. Kelly was my high school sweetheart at Floor High School, and we got married while attending Jefferson Davis College. But the economy collapsed and I couldn't find a decent job. Look, Kelly always likes nice things that I don't let her do. Then after a while I left, I thought to look for something better. It took me a while to track her down, but I finally found her in Atlanta where she was working in a bar. He told me he was glad to see me, but then he found a rich builder who could buy him all the gifts he wanted. How can we be together again? But I must hold back until she allows him to marry her. Of course, he married her because no one could resist Kelly. After some time, she called me and asked me to help her with her small project. One night it served him well. Later, while he was dozing in bed, I snuck up and jumped on his chest. Rayburn smiled happily. I couldn't even get my hands out from under the blanket. You should have seen his face before you put the pillow on him. After these words and leaving, Kelly went cold. He lay down on the bed and slept next to the body all night, as if waking up in the morning to find it dead in bed. He shook his head. She didn't know if she could do it, but she didn't care. Rayburn then frowned. But the fat guy may have the last laugh, because Kelly hasn't heard much from him since she found out he was deep in debt. Then he told me that I needed to find another rich pirate before we could get back together. When Atlanta got hot, he decided to move again. Even in pain, Barry couldn't stop spitting, so he moved to Richmond and found me. Rayburn laughed derisively. Yes, Barry Russell, you made a lot of money, but you were also disappointed. As things went from bad to worse for her, she decided she couldn't wait any longer to find her next victim. I think that's where Bill McAvoy comes in, Barry said wryly. That's right, smart boy. But first he needed to get rid of you, so he called me. But wait, Barry replied. Why do you want to kill me? She could get a divorce and move in with McAvoy. Rayburn looked at Barry like he was an idiot. Well, I needed to get something out of this situation, right? Since we have a prenuptial agreement, the only way we can get money from you is if you die. Barry was still confused. But it was Kelly who was killed, not me. Rayburn's face contorted with anger and despair. All clear. I hid in the barn and you were supposed to come and an unknown shooter shot you, but you didn't come. Suddenly she came through the door to see what was going on and I accidentally shot her. That's all, you are really wrong. The man starts pointing a gun at Barry's face and Barry desperately looks for a way to distract him or at least stop him. In his weakened state, he was unable to free his hands. You don't have to do this, Johnny. Killing me now won't help you. Leave me here and go while you can, Barry pleaded. The man walked nervously again. No, I have to put an end to this. She loves me. I had to do as she told me. But as soon as he raised the gun again, screams were heard from outside. Barry, Barry, are you there? Do you agree? Before Barry can warn her, Bridget bursts into the barn and is horrified to see Johnny Rayburn targeting her. Looks like you brought your friends after all, he smiled good-naturedly, meaning that he needed to take care of the two of you. He looked at Bridget for a long time and smiled like a wolf. But first, I want to have fun with you. I haven't been with a woman for a long time. No, Bridget exclaimed, tears streaming down her face. Do not touch me. Rayburn ignored him. He tucked the gun into the waistband behind him and walked toward the woman in front of him. Barry suddenly remembered what happened to Bridget's mother, and his heart sank. He thought she must have felt like she was about to pass out. Get away from her, he shouted helplessly, but Rayburn ignored him. Then, watching the scene in horror, Barry noticed something strange in Bridget's expression. This is not fear, he thought. This is anger. When Rayburn joined her, she screamed, I want to have fun! Bridget screamed louder, but not this time. To Rayburn and Barry's surprise, he pulled a small .38 caliber revolver from behind his back and fired. The shot hit Rayburn so close to the stomach that he doubled over. He stumbled back, fell on his back, and began to moan on the dirty, straw-covered ground. Bridget looked at the writhing figure for a moment, then ran up to Barry, knelt down next to him, hugged him, kissed him, and began to cry. Are you okay, Barry? She asked worriedly. I have a really bad headache, he replied. But I think you'll be fine. Thank God you're safe. Can you help me free my hands? As she tries to untie him, they hear another voice. Bridget, Bridget. They looked up to see a woman with a gun taking Weaver's fighting stance. Jill, Bridget shouted, and the two sisters ran to each other, hugged each other, and exhaled. 
When they had calmed down a little, Bridget asked, What brings you here? Jill hugged her tightly. When I received his voicemail, I was driving in a police car from Washington, D.C., with sirens blaring. I said I would never let anything happen to you. Jill looked warily at Barry and Rayburn lying on the floor of the barn, and Bridget hugged her gratefully. What did Barry do to you? Who is that boy? My God. I forgot about Barry, Bridget exclaimed. She took her sister's hand and pulled her towards Barry. Plug it in for me. As the two women struggled with the old leather reins, Barry saw a body lying on the barn floor and screamed, It's Johnny Rayburn, and he's got a gun in his pants. Gil ran up to the lying man who turned around, around him, and discovered that the gun was still in his belt. He took it out and tucked it into his belt. At this moment, Rayburn let out a terrible scream. Jill turned him over and examined his wounds. He then took out his phone and called an ambulance and the police. He turned to Barry and said, I think if you had done a ballistics test on the gun I just found, you would have found that it matched the gun that killed Kelly. This means that her first husband was behind all this. Barry nodded. Apparently they were never officially divorced. He looked at Rayburn and noticed how pale he had become. How is he? He asked Gil. She told him she was bleeding heavily. He couldn't do anything about the wound on his stomach. I didn't think I would live to see the ambulance arrive. These words made Bridget cry and Jill hugged her. Okay, BG, you did what you had to do. I'm proud of you. Barry looked at Bridget in confusion. I didn't know you had a gun. Where did you get this from? Bridget shrugged awkwardly. Jill gave it to me years ago. I always hated guns after what happened to my mom, but Jill insisted that I always carry one with me to protect myself. I've had it in my bag for years, but this is the first time I've had to use it. Then Johnny Rayburn moaned again. The three knelt next to him and Rayburn opened his eyes. When he saw Barry, he said hoarsely, I tricked you, mate. He got angry when he walked into the barn and saw that you weren't there. I asked him to forget about this plan and come with me. Then he told me that he didn't love me and would never come back to me. Then she laughed at me and I shot her. Barry, Bridget, and Jill looked at each other. Rayburn's voice became weaker. Then to his surprise, Rayburn laughed. You won't leave me now, Kelly. I know where you're going this time, and you better get ready because I'm going there too. He laughed again. Then his head fell to the dirty floor, his eyes hardening. Jill palpated the carotid artery, then shook his head and closed the dead man's eyelids. While they waited for the ambulance and police to arrive, Barry explained everything Rayburn admitted had happened, and Jill added details of her investigation. When medical personnel later arrived and decided to take Barry to the hospital for observation, Bridget insisted on following him in the car. Jill voluntarily stopped and told the police the whole story. After Barry was strapped to a gurney and taken to the ambulance, Bridget walked up to him, kissed him, and walked to her car. Gil then walked over and patted him on the arm. I'm ashamed, Barry. I'm convinced that you are a sociopath. I thought you killed Kelly and might try to do the same to Bridget. Now it turns out that Kelly was a real sociopath and her first husband was a murderer. I'm sorry that I doubted you. Barry smiled at him. It's okay, Jill. I understand. She looked at him seriously. You will never harm my sister. Barry watched as paramedics loaded Johnny Rayburn's body into another ambulance, then looked at Jill and shook his head. I don't dare, he said. Subscribe to our channel so that the second drop does not deceive you and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you are under 18 years of age, please do not listen to the following episodes.